Greetings. 30 years ago, I was working for Montclair State. One of my responsibilities was to teach a thinking skills program first thing in the morning, twice a week, to a class of first graders at Guajang Elementary School in Montclair. I would arrive early, stand in the hallway, and meet the students and their teacher as they entered from the other side of the building and filed into the classroom. One morning, as I was standing in my usual spot, and the six-year-olds were trundling into the room, I glanced down the hall and saw a woman near the main office waving hello to me in a very friendly manner. I was not quite sure I recognized her. I'd only been teaching the class for a couple of weeks and had not gotten to know many people. But I went ahead and waved back, especially since she seemed so amiable. She waved again, smiling more broadly this time, and I accordingly waved back with a bit more enthusiasm myself. I was about to turn to go into the classroom when she waved yet again. So I waved yet again. Now more curious about the person's identity, searching my memory for who she could be, and wondering why she seemed so happy to see me. Suddenly, she knelt down onto the floor and blew a kiss. It was at that moment that I looked down and saw one of the first grade boys standing beside me, <laughs> waving and blowing kisses back to her. I realized, to my mortification, that the entire interaction I thought I had been participating in was actually between this young child and his mother. The, other, the author, Melissa Dahl, describes experiences like this as cringeworthy in her book of the same title. It turns out that these kinds of situations tend to happen most when we're in our teens and twenties. Starting a new phase in life, as all of you are about to do, whether you're going off to college, getting a new job, or entering the military, means being in new environments in which you are especially attuned to the expectations of others and what they think about you. In such situations, awkward, uncomfortable interactions are more likely to occur. And perhaps your initial response to the cringeworthy experiences that you have, and will have, will be like my initial response to that interaction in the hallway. I wished it had never happened. I wished I had been more cognizant of what was going on around me. I wished I was not such a dork, and so on. These awkward, uncomfortable experiences, though, cannot and should not be wished away. They can actually teach us quite a lot. One educational lesson from my waving incident, for example, was that it was a good reminder to my 25-year-old self that I was not the center of the universe. For all of my embarrassment about the in incident and agonizing over it in the hours and even days afterward, it turned out that no one else appeared to have really noticed it. Which made sense the more I thought about it. The woman herself was focused on her son. Her son was focused on his mom. The other kids were headed into the room, and the teacher was focusing on the kids. As Dahl points out, so many of us waste so much time worrying what other people will think of us, but the truth is, they're mostly not thinking of us. The secret to feeling less awkward in everyday life, then, is not to closely monitor your own behavior so that you do and say the right thing at every turn. Instead of focusing inward, turn your attention outward onto the people in front of you. A second lesson I learned as a result of the incident was with the assistance of one of my colleagues at Montclair State. When I told her what had happened and how I felt so foolish and embarrassed, she said, why? What's wrong with waving at someone when they're not waving at you? Wouldn't the world be a better place if we were not so worried about looking cool? so that we were more open and friendly, even to people we did not know? I had to admit, she had a point. I'll spare you the further details of my ruminations about that embarrassing incident, but will summarize just by saying that what had first seemed to me to be an experience I wished had never occurred turned out to be instructive in many ways. As it has been pointed out by many wise people over the years, learning and growth 
often arise from some kind of unpleasantness or pain. It's awkward and uncomfortable to look foolish in front of everyone in a new school or at a new job. It can be awkward and uncomfortable to make mistakes and then have to address them, or to discuss difficult topics like illness or war or climate change, or to try something you're not very skilled at yet. It can be awkward and uncomfortable to talk with people with whom you strongly disagree. And yet, all of these can also be wonderful opportunities to grow as a person. While I would not go so far as to wish you more awkward, uncomfortable moments in the years ahead of you in whatever your next endeavors are, I do hope that when you find yourself in such a situation, you will remember that those cringeworthy experiences are not necessarily all bad. In fact, they are often excellent chances to learn about yourself, about others, about the world. Thank you and congratulations to parents, friends, staff, board members, and especially the members of the class of 2019. Every one of us does throughout our whole lives. 
From a young age, we are taught to think ahead and to keep looking forward. And we forget to stop and think about the moments that we should be enjoying. Whether it's rushing to school because we're late, trying to quickly finish some homework before class, or cramming math equations and Spanish vocab words into our heads right before some really big tests, because of course we love procrastinating just as much, there's barely any time to stop and take a breath. Right now, I want this graduation to be a time to stop and think about all of the amazing memories and moments, both big and small, that we have made throughout our time at school. Everyone uses the phrase, live in the moment. But what does that really mean? At this moment, I think it means to pause and take a look around. Look to your left and look to your right. Turn around and look at one of your closest friends. These relationships are much harder to grab onto and to keep hold of than any tangible item you'll ever own. So enjoy them while you can. Memorize these moments and pay attention to every single detail because your high school graduation only happens once. Of course we are all excited for the future, but we have so many years ahead of us to look forward to. Right now, it's important to live in the moment and enjoy every second we have and realize how lucky we are that we got to spend so much time with our best friends and our loved ones. At this moment, you might be thinking about how you loved high school and how you never want to leave. Or you might be thinking about how you hated it and you never want to come back. But we all have one thing in common, and that thing is the amazing memories that we made. If you think about a best friend or a favorite teacher, a lot of your time was spent here together. And without high school, you might have never made the connections that give you so much joy today. High school has given us so many opportunities to grow and become the people we are now. We are so different compared to the freshmen we once were, and we've all created such amazing bonds. The future is always going to be exciting, but it's also always going to be there. This moment, right now, won't be here forever. So we have to enjoy it while we can. For this graduation, I want everyone to be here in the moment because it's the last time we're all going to be here together. It's crazy to think that the person you're sitting next to has been living alongside you for so long, and now that person may be traveling across the country for college next year. I know everyone is always asking you what's next, but for now, just think about the fact that you're graduating. Spend time with your friends and family and soak up each and every one of these moments. Thank you for these past four years, and I'm so happy that we're all here today, in this moment, to graduate together. meaningful friendships, challenged ourselves, and made memories to last us a lifetime. My name is Jess Rizzo, and I feel extremely privileged to be able to speak to you this evening and reflect on our time at JCHS as we embark on this new chapter of our lives. While many of us will be going our separate ways in a few short months, I know we will never forget our time at JCHS, and we will remember that this community was one of the first places we called home. My aunt, who was also my godmother, passed away when I was just seven years old. She adored the movie, The Wizard of Oz. At a young age, I discovered the yellow brick road and learned of Dorothy's difficult return home to Kansas just by spending time at my aunt's house. I too fell in love with the film, mesmerized by Dorothy's red ruby slippers and her well-known companions, the scarecrow who longed for a brain, the tin man without a heart, and the cowardly lion. Because the Wizard of Oz has always held such a special place in my heart, I want to share the following quote from the movie. It's not where you go, it's who you meet along the way. Although our next few years will be dictated by a yellow brick road, 
leading us to our own Emerald Cities in the form of college or a career. We cannot forget that our journey will be marked by people who will influence and support us along the way. Just as Dorothy's adventure was impacted by the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Lion, our personal endeavors will be enriched by experience, kindness, and courage. First, whether we are attending a college in the fall, joining the workforce, or enlisting in the military, I want to encourage us to open ourselves to new experiences. The Scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz was obsessed with the idea of obtaining a brain because he felt that a brain was the one thing necessary for his success and happiness. While knowledge plays a big role in our decision making and future, it more importantly grants us the capacity for wisdom through the unique experiences we will have throughout our lifetimes. College is the ultimate opportunity for experimentation, whether that means trying out for your school's Quidditch team or sprint football team, taking a course on the science of superheroes, getting involved with community service, or joining an acapella group. With diverse experiences comes new knowledge and wisdom that we will carry with us for the rest of our lives. Similar to how the Spirit Crow learned that his adventures and the people he, with whom he shared them were more important than anything else. Second, the way we treat people in our lives is truly pivotal to our future prosperity and happiness. Just as the Tin Man saw the importance of having a big heart to love and feel love in return, we must remember that compassion and goodwill are essential qualities to possess while we travel on our individual yellow brick roads. If we ever encounter someone who feels lonely or left out, will we be the person who reaches out to them with a smile and makes them feel more comfortable and included? We can take that first step in developing a relationship that might come to change a life, even if that one step is just a corny joke, meaningful eye contact, or a simple smile. Especially in the world of chaos we live in today, one act of kindness can go a long way and allows us to feel a deeper level of compassion in return. We must not get caught up in being kind for the sake of personal satisfaction. Our kindness is so important because it allows others to feel a sense of acceptance and inclusion. For the Tin Man, reaching the Emerald City was not his greatest achievement. He found the most fulfillment in receiving a heart that allowed him to feel the love of others and reciprocate it. Third, I believe the two most important qualities to have in college or throughout our careers are confidence and courage. Dorothy's journey was enriched by the lion's transformation from a coward to a fearless, courageous beast. The lion did not know that he was capable of such a powerful roar until he began to believe in himself. Each of us has an equally courageous roar nestled inside us, and all we have to do is have the confidence to unleash it to fulfill our ultimate potential. In the words of Linda, the Good Witch of the South, you've always had the power, my dear. You just had to learn it for yourself. Let's use our voices or our roar to inspire and empower others. Once the lion realized he had the unconditional support of Dorothy, the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the Wizard, whether he displayed his valor or not, he found his inner strength and grew more confident in himself. Even when we feel most afraid, we can be brave, knowing that we will always have the support of the people who mean the most to us. And we can hold our heads up high, just as the lion in the Wizard of Oz ultimately did. I would like to take a brief moment to thank some people who have been instrumental in my own journey. Similar to the way Toto had Dorothy's back, I too have had several people in my life who have always had my best interests at heart. I would first like to thank my parents for constantly supporting me in my academic, musical, and extracurricular endeavors even when I often put a little too much on my plate at once. They have taught me that there is nothing I can achieve without hard work and a positive attitude. A big thank you goes out to my sister, Alyssa, who has been my role model for as long as I can remember, and to her husband, Dom, both of whom traveled six hours to be here and support me tonight. I would also like to recognize my younger brother, Jim, for keeping me humble and reminding me of how lucky I am to have someone to share all my adventures with. And thank you to the rest of my family that is here to cheer me on, especially my grandma and all my friends who have been there for me through.
through everything. Finally, I want to thank Mrs. Podvesker, Mrs. Ryan, and my sister Alyssa for helping me with this speech. In brief, we each have an unknown path ahead of us, our yellow brick roads to our futures and emerald cities, which likely will take us in new, exciting directions. Significant challenges lie ahead, including rigorous coursework, demanding jobs and internships, and even the occasional vicious apple tree or flying monkey. However, we must never lose sight of the people who are there to support us on our difficult journey, whether that person is a teacher, parent, friend, or trusty scarecrow. Most importantly, let's use our brains for intellectual success and to gain wisdom through new experiences, our hearts to undertake new levels of compassion and kindness, and our courage and confidence to follow our own unique yellow brick road, wherever it may lead us. Then, we will be well on our way to a life of meaning in college, the land of Oz, and beyond. Congratulations to the class of 2019. If you ever find yourself lost or confused on your yellow brick road, just throw on a pair of red ruby slippers, click your heels three times, and remember, there is truly no place like home. Thank you. Three cliches and a quote. My friend and fellow teacher said to me after I remarked about a moving graduation speech, What? I asked. How difficult can giving a commencement address be? He responded. Just mention three cliches and then throw in a quote by someone famous like Teddy Roosevelt, he's patriotic, or Henry David Thoreau, or the existentialist. And you can never go wrong with Gandhi. It's not brain surgery. I didn't realize until this year that this sarcastic comment has haunted me over the past 20 years. I have delivered keynote speeches at a number of celebrations and presented at numerous graduation events, always fearful of inserting too many cliches or tri trite quotes. Parents, families, members of the Board of Education, administrators, teachers, and most of all, seniors. It is an honor to present this class to the Board of Education today, June 20th, 2019. This year in particular, I wanted to offer some time-tested sage advice because the class of 2019 holds a special place in my heart. Not only is it a class full of talented, bright, and good-natured scholars, but also your freshman year was my first year as the principal at James Caldwell High School. So this is the first class at JCHS that I had the pleasure of watching tentatively enter as a nervous freshman and observe over four short years your growth into mature, academic young adults ready for a more independent life. In addition, this class is special to me because you and my family were on parallel journeys as my son entered high school the same year as you. This is a surreal experience for an educator when you have a child who grows to be the age of the students you've been teaching for 25 years. Not only does this make you feel old, but your perspective shifts. For example, instead of seeing students practicing their parallel parking in the lot after school and reminiscing about when I was learning to drive, I more often, might more often see the experience through the eyes of the parent and the simultaneous joy and terror they experience from this rite of passage. Witnessing the major high school milestones from a parent's perspective, the exhilaration and stress, the success and failures, the disappointment and triumphs of high school life, 
It somehow amplified those feelings when you experienced them as well. Even tonight, with graduation, I sense from parents' perspective the gravity of this moment and the intrinsic pressure to impart wisdom to you and to my son. Clearly, there are millions of pieces of advice that parents hope to reinforce before their children leave the nest. But given a finite amount of time, I narrowed all you need to know down into four ideas. Unfortunately, these valuable words of advice are often best communicated through common cultural expressions. And that is when I remembered my friend's comment about commencement speeches. So for tonight, in honor of my old colleague Bob, and in hopes of sharing wisdom from a parent's perspective, I set out to write a speech sharing three wise cliches and a profound quote. I wrote my speech, and then I realized Bob was wrong about one thing. Three cliches and a quote could be the subject of a book, not the focus of a commencement speech. So I'm going to briefly mention my first cliche and the quote, while spending a little more time on the last two. Don't worry, that time writing my first draft wasn't wasted. I'm going to make my son sit through the entire thing when he gets home from project graduation tomorrow morning. <laughs> Cliche one, you have to be able to get out of bed in the morning and look yourself in the mirror. Briefly, you have all developed a moral code, you know right from wrong, and we parents dread that there will be times when you will be tempted to bend the rules, take the easy way out, or compromise your character to get something you want. If you fail, stay true to your character. If you don't, you will be emotionally lost. My one quote that I was going to discuss, I shared with you first at freshman orientation and multiple times since. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people forget will forget what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel, by Maya Angelou. This should resonate as you reflect upon the past four years and dream of the future. What is your legacy? And what kind of impact will you have on the lives and the community you join next fall? If you will indulge me, I will spend a bit more time adding context to the last two cliches. Cliche number two. Expect nothing and be open to everything. If getting a solid high school education teaches you anything, it is that we have much more to learn about everything. Jessica expressed this beautifully in her speech. I will just add that as a parent recently walking on college tours where I found excitement in the great academic opportunities available, but my son was more concerned about season tickets for college football. Take advantage of all the opportunities available to you. This is the time in your life that you get to be the most selfish in a good way. Focusing on yourself and your growth, okay. but you need to be open to those opportunities in order to seize them. The other part of this cliche, expect nothing, warrants some explanation. Set your goals and fantasize about your future, but don't expect that people will, that these things will just happen. You have to make them happen. People who expect things grow resentful when they are not given to them. They are difficult to achieve, or they fail. They become resentful when others appear to more easily get what they want, or people don't act the way they expect them to behave. The day I was leaving for college, I finished packing my mom's old blue Datsun hatchback. With only room in the car for two, my dad planned to stay behind. Before my mom and I got on the road to Delaware, my dad shook my hand and I could feel him slipping me cash. And he said, buy yourself something when you're down there. Now, I was one of seven children. My dad was a postal worker. I assumed most of the college debt. So getting money from him was a big deal. I closed my fist and I closed, my, I closed the bill in my fist. I got in the car so I didn't seem impolite by checking how much it was. As we started to pull out of the driveway, I looked into my hand and I saw a $5 bill. 
Now, I may look old, but even when I went to school, $5 was not going to get you very far. My dad didn't finish college and was a bit out of touch, but I didn't expect any money, and I harbored no resentment. As I look back at the experience, though, as a parent, I also realized that I missed a valuable lesson. That people who expect people to act differently don't usually value what they have. I didn't expect my dad to change, but I thought dad should be a certain way. Not only did I have no right to be resentful, but I should have appreciated more all that my parents did for me including working the night shifts and long hours of overtime to, so I could live in a community with a good education that was safe and that could prepare me for my trip to Delaware. And most importantly, I wouldn't have missed the symbol of the five dollars and what it meant to him. The final cliche is less advice and more words of comfort from a parent or a guardian to a graduating senior. I will always love you no matter what. And I say it in hopes that all of you can identify at least one person who you know feels this way about you. When my sons were younger, my favorite book to read to them was titled, No Matter What. In the story, the young fox named Small exclaims that he is grim and grumpy and doesn't think his parent, Large, loves him at all. They go through a number of scenarios and at the end of each, Large says, I will always love you no matter what. When children are young, this is a given. For an innocent child doesn't know what he does. But as children go, grow older, I'll always love you no matter what becomes a commitment. As young adults, the stakes get higher. Mistakes and emotions have a greater impact. And you should know that in tough times, regardless of how great an error you may have created, or how disappointed you might be in yourself, you are loved. If there is a piece of advice associated with this quote to share, it is to remember that love is also a verb. Stephen Covey, in The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, makes this point. In essence, that loving someone requires effort. Don't just expect your relationships will stay strong. You have to be proactive. And make time for those you love to nourish those relationships. This means that if you travel away next fall, continue to reach out, call. Don't just text your siblings, family members, and friends. Ask, how are you doing? And listen to their response. Make the effort to keep the healthy relationships nourished while you build new ones. And make sure you let the important people in your life know that you love them. The word love is strong one, and best reserved for families, friends, and romantic relationships. But also remember that you are members of the James Caldwell High School family, and the faculty, administration, and I care immensely about you. We will be with you in spirit on the next leg of your journey. The story, no matter what, ends with small asking large, but what about when you're far away? Does your love go to, or does it stay? And large replies, look up at the stars, they're far, far away, but their light reaches us at the end of the day. It's like that with love. We may be close, we may be far, but our love still surrounds us wherever we are. Regardless of where your journey takes you, be emboldened by the knowledge that you will forever have the support of the educators and administrators of the Caldwell West Caldwell School District. Please come back and share with us stories of your discoveries and remember one last JCHS cliche. Once achieved, always achieved. entire Board of Education, it gives me great pleasure to present to you the James Caldwell High School graduating class of 2000. I confirm that they have met the requirements for 
High School graduation set by the State of New Jersey and the Caldwell West Caldwell School District.
Nicholas Bruno Castellano. Gianna Maria Cecilia. Ethan Jedediah Carpentier. Francisco Javier Chavez. Dante Lewis Ciccioni, James Richard Clemens, Alexander J. Code, Vienna Rose Coca, Robin Rose Calora.
Caitlin Grace Joy. Riyad Khan. Elizabeth Kiernan. Andrew Jared Kiesiger. Michael Christopher King. James R. Canale. Timothy Colin Knapp. Brittany Lynn Cochelle. Justin Kozborski. <laughs> Natasha Allison Lashak. <laughs> Dallas M. Lamarca.
Rebecca Isaac Zaki. Nina Amber Zazera. Graduating class of 2000. 